Okay, so what I want to do now is deal with Einstein's falsification of history and the relevant places I would be referring to is this and this place here. Basically, Einstein wants to, wants to present a different history uh, well actually he changes his version of history of how he's dealing with his relativity theory and his unified field theory and he's trying to give an idealised uh, way of dealing with science and that's why he's going to falsify history so we go on to these links now so this is the first one this is the professor uh, I'll be referring to who's given the talk and he's a professor at Amsterdam and he's at the facility of science there so we go to his talk now this is picking up the relevant place from his talk allow play okay so what have we seen well we've seen that uh, the idea of mathematical naturalness um, um, and uh, experience right the, the the emphasis on these two uh, 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 starting points uh, for formulating theories was emphasized. The emphasis changed over the years. So what we're dealing with, UFT means unified field theory. And for Einstein, his mathematical naturalness and experience uh, changed his, uh, what he places on these things changed over the years. 1920s, 1950s, and this is involved in his unified field theory program. So his recollection of what happened in 1915 is when he came up with general relativity changes to match his changing point of view. Um, as we go from the 1920s to the 1950s, just as Einstein's engagement with unified field theory and his commitment to unified field theory changed during the same period as well. Now this goes hand in hand with a change in recollection of what happened in 1915. Um, and you can draw these black and white images of what he says in 1918 and what he says in 1954. But you know, there's also an intermediate stage, right? So here in 1918... So basically what we're doing here now is quotes from Einstein. And Einstein's going to change his opinion. So we go through these. So in 1918, he's going to say something different to what he's saying in 1923, and in 1945, he's saying something else again. Now, I think we've seen the quote before, let me just uh, uh, read it again. Girard teaches us that for a theory to deserve trust, it has to be built on generalizable facts. A truly useful and deep theory has never been found in a purely speculative fashion. I think that's from the letter to Besso that you also used. Um, okay, so, you know, um, uh, speculation, no, facts, that's where you should start off with. 1923, and this is then the intermediate way of looking at things. Unfortunately, we cannot base ourselves on empirical facts, as in the derivation of the theory of gravity, the quality of gravitation and inert mass, but are limited to the criterion of mathematical simplicity, which is not free from arbitrary aspect. So, so he's basically changing his opinion between 1923 and 1918, and... In 1918, it's not based upon purely fa speculative fashion, and in 1923, he's uh, changing his opinion on that. So, because he's deciding we can't base things entirely on empirical facts in 1923. The idea that you start off with, with experience is, is still present in his work, but, you know, unfortunately he cannot rely on it because he's doing these unified field theories now and he has to rely on mathematical simplicity, but, you know, yeah, it has its arbitrary aspects. 1949, autobiography. I have learned from the theory of gravitation no collection of empirical facts can lead to the formulation of such complicated equations. They can be found only through the discovery of a logically simple mathematical condition, right? So, that so he's changed his opinion completely. In 1949, theory, which is general relativity, doesn't come from empirical facts. It's coming from uh, what he's claiming to be 
uh, logical simple mathematical condition through the discovery of a logical simple mathematical condition uh, and 1918 he's saying uh, tru a truly useful and deep theory has never been found in a purely speculative fashion so he's saying it's not found by a speculative fashion in 1918 in effect in 1949 he's saying it is so this is the problem we find of Einstein he changes his opinion on things so what is general relativity supposed to be is it supposed to be what he's talking about in 1918 or is it talking about in 1949 what is it supposed to be where is it supposed to be coming from it's, it just leads to masses of confusion as a complete opposite of what he would say in 1949 so, yeah, so as says he's pointing out it's 1949, he's saying complete opposite to 1918. I'll go back and pick that up again. Let's emphasize it. It has its arbitrary aspects. 1949, autobiography. I have learned from the theory of gravitation no collection of empirical facts can lead to the formulation of such complicated equations. They can be found only through the discovery of a logically simple mathematical condition. Right? So there's a complete opposite of what he would say. In 1949. So, there's a so he's completely opposite in 1949. This is how bad he is. He says the complete opposite. Give him long enough and yeah, say the complete opposite. Transition taking place. Okay, so um, as I've argued before, reshaping his recollections were an instrument in pleading for unified field theory. So what he's basically doing is reshaping, reshaping, reshaping his recollections, which is his history. And that is his pleading for unified field theory. So that's what the idea of changing what he's thinking from 1918 to what he later thinks. That's the whole idea of re-changing his history. And this is a book that has been referred to. So pick it, pick it up again. So between 19, 1918 and 1949, he changes his opinion and that basically means he has to change his history of how he came up with uh, general relativity. ...of a logically simple mathematical condition, right? So there's a complete opposite of what he would say in 1949. So there's this transition taking place. Okay, so um, as I've argued before, reshaping his recollections were an instrument in pleading for unified field theory. And, and you know, if you think that uh, I've been onto something here, then I advise you to read the, the book, uh, Einstein's Unification, that I uh, published a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, should you not like what follows, then rest assured that book will not contain any of what follows. Um, but I'm going to use um, um, Einstein's change of recollection in trying to argue that there is a more close, closely, closer connection between, between you know, how we judge theories and, and how we make moral judgments, and, and that the process itself is a bit more alike uh, than you would perhaps expect beforehand, and that has to do with... with Engaging yourself with the idea of a ideal scholar. So, come over that again. Uh, recollection, that is the history, his recounted recollection of general relativity, of how he came to it. He's changed his history on that subject, and that uh, changes your idea of how you're going to portray that your image to the outside world. So picking up again from that. You know, how we judge theories and, and how we make moral judgments, and, and that the process itself is a bit more alike uh, than you would perhaps expect beforehand, and that has to do with, with engaging yourself with the idea of a ideal scholar. Now, of course, if we, if we you know... Let's see. Uh, Einstein, by changing his history, he's trying to persuade, betray himself as the ideal scientist or the ideal scholar and that's to advertise his uh, unified field theory the virtues of it basically what he's trying to build upon is his relativity to come up with the unified field theory and he's trying to advertise the virtues upon his thinking process from relativity to his attempts at unified field theory it's the way a high idea of changing the history you know, how we judge theories and, and how we make moral judgments and, and that the process itself is a bit more alike uh, 
uh, that you would perhaps expect beforehand, and that has to do with, with engaging yourself with the idea of an ideal scholar. Now, of course, if we, if we you know, recount our recollections, then, then we present an image of ourselves to you know, our audiences, and, and Einstein, of course, was very much aware that when he would tell his own history, he was presenting you know, his history of, of or a way of doing science. And that so the idea of changing the history of how he came up with his theories is to uh, deal with the way to deal with science where he wants people to deal with science. ...to ourselves, to you know, our audiences, and, and Einstein, of course, was very much aware that when he would tell his own history, he was presenting you know, his history of, of or a way of doing science, and that that way of doing science um, you know, could possibly be emulated. Um, so he had an agenda, perhaps, in um, um, formulating himself, or, or in, in, in telling the history of, of GR the way that he did. Now, um, that brings us to this notion of epistemic virtues, and, and in the history of science, there's you know, substantial literature on this, on this um, uh, perhaps um, uh, most famously by uh, uh, Lorraine Dast and Peter Gelson. Recently, they, they produced a book on objectivity. Um, you, know, you, you probably know about it. And, and they do make this, this strong link between sort of the idealized scholar that, that circulates in certain uh, uh, communities of scholars and ways to do science. Um, um, and they give a number, number of examples, for instance. Uh, they say that uh, uh, in the 18th century, there was a figure that circulated that was particularly the genius. And that genius had this quality to get to the essence of things, right? So that you could... and that, that's the uh, image that they try to present of Einstein, that sort of genius. He's able to work out how nature works just by thinking about it. And it's all to do with creating a false history of how Einstein came up with his uh, theory or theories of relativity. Uh, communities of scholars and ways to do science. Um, um, and they give a num number of examples, for instance. Uh, they say that uh, uh, in the 18th century there was a figure that circulated that was particularly the genius. And that genius had this quality to get to the essence of things, right? That he could attain a certain truth in nature, and he could do that by, by simply being um, the unique um, uh, genius that, that, that he was. And then, you know, in the 19th century, they argue that this new objective figure uh, comes about, and this person um, um, finds, finds theories and science by, by aspiring to look objectively, by, by uh, sort of factoring away his own personal, say, genius insights, but, but to just simply portray the facts as they, as they present themselves. So what you see here are certain epistemic virtues, so certain ways of, of, of doing science, and how they are tied to certain ideal persona. You know, the, the, the genius, the sage, who discerns the essence on the one hand, and, and the uh, selfless scientist, in the case of the objective scientist, on the other hand. So there's an ideal scientist that you know, we emulate and that we write in textbooks about and that we try to teach our students to follow, because that person has certain qualities and follows certain virtues in trying to attain knowledge. And that, that's how they try to portray Einstein, as this sort of ideal scientist, ideal scholar, who's had all these sort of virtues, and leads to the sort of science he's come up with. Picking up again. In the case of the objective scientist, on the other hand. So there's an ideal scientist that you know, we emulate and that we write in textbooks about and that we try to teach our students to follow because that person has certain qualities and follows certain virtues in trying to attain knowledge. Okay, now, um, how does that relate to Einstein? How does that relate to the ideal version of Einstein that, that he crafted himself? Now, Lorraine Dessen has actually looked into Einstein, um, and, and she wrote a, wrote a paper on it. Um, and she claims that Einstein was this, you know, this objective scholar. He's the, 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 the clear exemplar of the objective scholar. But, you know, if, well, Looking at it in, in, in some detail, I, I, you know, I like to pick at an argument a little bit. I think she makes a strong case that, that the objective scholar is translated in the, in the case of Einstein into the scholar that um, aspires to invariant formulation symmetries. That that's what he wants to find in theories. But you know, I don't know. I don't see a very obvious, clear connection between being objective and being somebody who wants to find symmetries in theories. That that's just a bridge, perhaps too far. Of course, simplicity and naturalness are related to invariance, but you know, objectivity is just something that I don't immediately see fitting there. 
Um, and in fact, Einstein himself, he doesn't, he doesn't, you know, play up the objective scholar too much in his own writing. Um, uh, and of course, if you actually, uh, uh, you know, one thing that as an objective scholar you should do is to render the phenomena immediately and, and, and directly. And, you know, that's just not what Einstein was about uh, when he was doing unified field theory. He just didn't relate to phenomena too much. Um, and, and perhaps even more importantly, when, when Einstein sort of presents the ideal scholar, um, well, that's very much the 19th century genius, right? The, 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 the person that, that you know, uh, uh, has this unique... Einstein's idea, idea uh, is the genius. Uh, yeah, the, 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 um, um, the unique quality that the genius would have. So in that sense, he's perhaps a bit more... Well, he's not the... You know, he doesn't refer to this to the selfless objective scholar that uh, uh, figures so prominently in uh, uh, Destin and Gelson's book. So, you know, I don't think that this is necessarily the way to look at Einstein. But there is perhaps something when we, when we, uh, th there's something to be gained by retaining this notion of, of looking at um, um, uh, virtues of uh, idealized scholars as, 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 as ways to uh, understand why they believe that, you know, by doing certain things you, you gain knowledge. And that there's a relation between uh, what you could say epistemic virtues and this idealized notion of, of the scholarly uh, persona that, that would circulate. Okay. So Einstein, you know, presented himself, his own history as a variant of the ideal scholar. So that's Einstein presenting his own history and as we pointed out his history has changed from uh, the different statements he makes over the years he's changing his version of history. You know by doing certain things you, you gain knowledge and that there's a relation between uh, what you could say, epistemic virtues and this idealized notion of, of the scholarly uh, persona that, that would circulate. Okay, so Einstein, you know, presented himself, his own history, as a variant of the ideal scholar, um, um, and um, um, would hold it up as an example to be, to be followed, um, um, and, and why did he do so? Well, he wanted to justify the work that he was doing. At so the reason why he's rewriting history is to justify the work that he's doing. History as a variant of the ideal scholar. Um, um, and um, um, would hold it up as an example to be, to be followed. Um, 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 and why did he do so? Well, he wanted to justify the work that he was doing at the time. And that, that explains why he was falsifying his recollection in a way. Or there you go. He actually says it there. Einstein, he says, he says about Einstein. Einstein's falsifying his recollection of what he's doing. Einstein is falsifying the history of what he's doing, and the idea for doing that is to present an ideal theorist as to how you come up with the theory ideas that he's coming up with. He's presenting a false history to give the ideal theorist. Well, he wanted to justify the work that he was doing mm -hmm. at the time, and that, that explains why he was falsifying his recollection in a way, or perhaps not falsifying his recollection, but, but misrepresenting his own history. Misrepresenting his own history. Another way of saying falsifying it. Um, um, and... Um, um, would hold it up as an example to be to be followed, um, um, and, and why did he do so? Well, he wanted to justify the work that he was doing at the time, and that that explains why he was falsifying his recollection in a way, or perhaps not falsifying his recollection, but but misrepresenting his own history. I mean, maybe he just came to believe his own history the way that he uh, reported it. So maybe he Einstein came to believe his own lies. Basically, you're falsifying history, creating lies, and Einstein so convincing that he even maybe convinced himself to believe in the lies. Well, he wanted to justify the work that he was doing at the time, and that, that explains why he was falsifying his recollection in a way, or perhaps not falsifying his recollection, but, but misrepresenting his own history. I mean, maybe he just came to believe his own history the way that he uh, reported it. Um, okay, so, so what are the examples where Einstein would misrepresent his own history 
uh, other than the case of general relativity. So this is an example of where Einstein is misrepresenting his own history and SRT that means special relativity, MM that means the Michelson Morley experiment. So what Einstein came to say about the Michelson Morley experiment just changed over the years. He's saying one thing one moment about it, then changing his mind and saying something else. This is uh, this is terrible. This is why we get so much of a mess for Einstein, falsifying his history, misrepresenting his history, however you like to call it. Eventually, he believes his own lies. But, but misrepresenting his own history, I mean, maybe he just came to believe his own history the way that he believed uh, his own lies. Um, okay, so so what are the examples where Einstein would misrepresent his own history? Uh, other than in the case of general relativity, um, uh, or perhaps even the history of others, in order to argue for an idealized way of doing scholarly work. Well, for instance, in the case of the special theory of relativity, there's a lot of literature on the role of the Michelson Morley experiment. And if you look into Einstein's earlier pronouncements on the role of the Michelson Morley experiment, there are indications that you know he was very comfortable saying that the Michelson Morley experiment, you know, did play a role in the history of special relativity. But later, again, he very much emphasizes that the Michelson Morley experiment had no role whatsoever. In the history of special activity. Now, right, in so you get that. One moment Einstein is saying Michelson Morley had a central role in his special theory of relativity, and later on he says it doesn't. This is this is how much of a mess you get into with Einstein. He's just changing his mind all the time, and he changes his mind, and it results in a change in history. It's a change in history of so how. How did he get to his various different theories? He just changes it. ...that the Michelson Morley experiment you know, did play a role in the history of special relativity. But later, again, he very much emphasizes that the Michelson Morley experiment had no role whatsoever in the history of special relativity. Now, in empiricist's accounts of how special theory of relativity was formulated, uh, the Michelson Morley experiment, you, you can think of Millikan, for instance, figures very prominently, right? So this is a positioning himself, his own history, as opposed to certain empiricists' account, accounts of uh, uh, the history of special relativity. Now, the way to do science, um, as it's presented by Einstein, also has certain uh, moral overtones. So, you know, he... Moral overtones. Anyway, so we've got Einstein misrepresenting his own history. Basically, everything is built on a lie, as per this video. This is why you get. This is why you get what the lie on which Einstein's relativity is built. This is why you get it, because he's changing his mind. He's rewriting his history of what he did. He's just lying. It's just a lie. It's all built on a lie. You call that a virtue. He's got got you've got the idea of you've got to do science in an ideal sort of way, and he wants to present that, and so he's having to lie about what he's done in this development of his uh, relativity. Uh, the Michael Smalley experiment, you can think of Millikan, for instance, figures very prominently, right? So this is a positioning himself, his own history, as opposed to certain empiricist account accounts of uh, uh, the history of special relativity. Now, the way to do science, um, as it's presented by Einstein, also has certain uh, moral overtones. So, you know, he quotes, uh, or, or he says that humans constantly overestimate measurement. Right? But, you know, well, a human, that's perhaps, you know, that's, that's a very, you know, a very vulnerable, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, that's, that's not a grand visionary, right? That's a very sort of low way of, of, of presenting somebody. Um, if there's a conflict with experience, is that, is that something profound? No, that's trivial. And if you let yourself be diverted by that, right, then, then you know, you're following a trivial, a trivial circumstance. There are more subtle motives to choose your theories. You shouldn't, you shouldn't go with, with trivial phenomena. You should go with more profound things. And if the unification program fails, then what will remain, the kind of science that remains, is this very superficial science. Right? So to do the unification kind of science, that's, that's an elevated way of doing science, that's, that's uh, well, a virtuous person, a virtuous person when he's doing uh, 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 theory.
theoretical physics. Now, this again resonates strongly with what Bernstein would, would present as the ideal scholar. A true theorist, Einstein again, a true theorist believes that comprehension is built on premises of great simplicity, right? A true theorist, right? Not the superficial kind, but the true theoretical physicist um, goes for great simplicity. Another example, I mean, Einstein wouldn't just hold himself up as the ideal scholar. He also would, for instance, refer to Planck. In, in the case of Planck, uh, Planck used to say good things about Einstein. And so Einstein is basically saying uh, good things about Planck as a compliment. They're both complementing each other. This is how Einstein uh, relates to Planck. The longing for this pre-established harmony that Planck would have is a source for Planck's perseverance and patience with which he's devoted himself to the most general problems of our science. Right? So again, you know, the, the, the way to do science and, and, and the kind of science that you're trying to do, the kind of science that shows you the pre-established harmony, is tied with certain moral, moral qualities, perseverance and patience and devotion. Um, Planck is also made into somebody who's very much you know, involved with the unification program. He's trying to unify the quantum and the electromagnetic field. Um, but there's also, for instance, this uh, statement about Planck. The world of phenomena uniquely determines the theoretical system, is how he describes the state of physics in 1918. Um, and, 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 you know, he says that Planck would actually follow this, this way of doing uh, physics. But then again, that's 1918. That's how he describes Planck's relation to experiment in 1918. How does he describe Planck's relation to experiment in 1949? Planck's work on the quantum was not in any way influenced by discoveries of an experimental nature at all. Now, if you so we get that onto this actual uh, thing on Planck's work on the quantum was really supposed to be based on the idea of uh, the black body radiation. That's if you look at it from uh, the usual official account of that, what Planck was doing, but Einstein is going to say no, Planck's work is not based on experimental nature, it's not influenced by experimental nature. When 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 other accounts, when the main main mainstream account is saying Planck's work was, this is how messed up Einstein is. Again, that's 1918. That's how he describes Planck's relation to... 1918, then in 1949, he says different. In 1949. Planck's work on the quantum was not in any way influenced by discoveries of an experimental nature at all. Now, if you know the history of the black body problem, that's just, you know, that's just silly, right? That's just completely... So as he's pointing out, this, this, this is just silly. Saying that is just silly, because it doesn't correspond to what, what has been said about Planck's work on quantum. Based on yeah, experiment. That's, that's how he describes Planck's relation to experiment in 1918. How does he describe Planck's relation to experiment in 1949? Planck's work on the quantum was not in any way influenced by discoveries of an experimental nature at all. Now, if you know the history of the black body problem, that's just, you know, that's just silly, right? That's just completely wrong. So, you know, he's basically not just recrafting himself, but he's also recrafting Planck into this, yeah, this, this, this you know, idealized, non-historic figure that he's presenting to us as an example to be emulated, so that we all start doing unified field theory as scientists. And, you know, another example, of course, and I've, I've given you many quotes already. In general relativity, I did not go with experience because that's not going to get you anywhere. I use logical simplicity, mathematical naturalness. Um, if you let yourself be tempted into doing some sort of complicated mathematics, then really you're sinning. Sin is sin, even when committed by respectable men. So in the end, you know, if you do unified field theory, then you're being a virtuous scientist. You're, you're, you're affecting the qualities that a true scientist should have. Um, and, um, well, how does he argue for that? By giving this idealized version of himself. And you can even understand um, 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 how his, 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 his representing himself as this idealized version translates into how he thinks about morality. I mean, he even literally says in a paper on good and evil that, you know, there's a certain scientist and that scientist is what the good person is. What does that scientist do? How does he relate to his work? Well, it's not the fruits of scientific research that elevated a man. It's not the fruits. No, um, 
Um, that doesn't enrich his nature, but the urge to understand, the intellectual work. Now, why does this relate to unified field theory? Well, unified field theory didn't have any fruits. It was, you know, it was just not going anywhere, right? So, you know, that's not, well, if you, if you just go for the results, then you're not a good person, right? But you should aspire to understanding, true understanding. But what is true understanding for Einstein? Well, let me look at the following quote. We mean by simplicity that the system contains as few independent assumptions or actions as possible for the totality of logically independent actions stands for the ununderstood remainder. My own efforts first and foremost concern the logical unity of physics. One wants to understand the existing real world, right? So, you know, there's a link between being, you know, a good person and by unifying, because that's how you attain understanding. Okay, so would Einstein believe that what he's doing in unified field theory is actually good, that that makes him a good scientist, somebody to follow? And he would say, yes. Um, um, uh, would his colleagues agree? No. Um, and in fact, they would they would reject him vehemently. They would reject, would reject this idealized version of himself as exactly not the kind of physicist you should be. Right? And you can think about people like Oppenheimer uh, very strongly arguing against um, um, what Einstein was doing at the time and also arguing against the kind of person that he had become. He had become cuckoo, Oppenheimer. Cuckoo. Relevant word is cuckoo. This is Einstein's method to science. It's cuckoo. And... That ties into the video I've got. Oh. There we go. go, Einstein cuckoo process, uh, article by G. Bernstein Brown, he looked at the question, what is wrong with relativity, and what is wrong with relativity is Einstein has a cuckoo process. So people have noticed that what Einstein is doing is cuckoo, it is cuckoo, as mentioned here. He's present, Einstein's trying to present himself as an ideal theorist and in order to do that he's having to rewrite his own history of what he's been doing with his work on relati relati relativity theory and when you look at what when you look at what Einstein is doing it is just cuckoo and lost contact with the profession of physics it's just insane nonsense and various of my videos have pointed out that uh, coming to the conclusion that what Einstein is talking about is nonsense that that is a valid conclusion to reach okay. he would say yes um, um, uh, would his colleagues agree no, no. Um, and in fact they would they would reject him vehemently they would reject, would reject this idealized version of himself as exactly not the kind of physicist you should be, right? And you can think about people like Oppenheimer uh, very strongly arguing against um, 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 what Einstein was doing at the time and also arguing against the kind of person that he had become. He had become cuckoo, cuckoo. Oppenheimer would say. Lost contact with the profession of physics. Yeah. Now, Oppenheimer, of course, uh, didn't just say that because um, um, that's what he thought, but, but Oppenheimer was, of course, the new example of physics, right? The new leader of the field, the new professional icon that people would follow. And again, there you find moral overtones. I mean, Einstein was wasting his time. So the rejection of, of unified field theory as a project... Got yeah, but he's cuckoo. Einstein is cuckoo. But he's projecting this persona of being a super-mega-genius. goes together with the rejection of Einstein as an ideal scholar. Okay, so um, I think I've gone through this. Uh, so what have we done? Well, we've identified the virtues that Einstein would, would, would use in uh, doing unified field theory. Um, 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 uh, we've seen 
how um, his recollection of how he would use these changed over time as the relative weight of, say, experience versus striving for mathematical methods um, in his practice of physics also changed over time. Um, this was accompanied by changing his own history, right? He, he came changed his, his own history. Himself he as, mentions it there, Einstein changes his own history. And I suppose so the justification for Einstein to change his history is because he wants to present this ideal way of doing uh, science. And this is an ideal theorist point of view. He's trying to present himself as a genius. This is a ge mega genius. And it's it, when you really look at it, it's just cuckoo. So, um, I think I've gone through this. Uh, so what have we done? Well, we've identified the virtues that Einstein would, would, would use in uh, doing unified field theory. Um, 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 uh, we've seen how um, his recollection of how he would use these changed over time as the relative weight of, say, experience versus striving for mathematical methods um, in his practice of physics also changed over time. Um, this was accompanied by changing his own history, right? He, he came up with this new version of himself as uh, the example to follow. Um, so what you see is that these theoretical virtues and the ideal scholar, they sort of develop in tandem, and if one is rejected as open ended with Einstein, so is the other. Um, now, how do these things, how do these epistemic virtues help us in, in, in writing history? Um, well, first of all, we can just identify these virtues and, and see how they work in, uh, in science. Um, we can better understand somebody's biography and certainly also some, how somebody would, would write about what the ideal scholar is, and even in, in, in sort of moral matters when, in the case of Einstein, um, uh, he uh, expresses himself on ethical issues. So we get a better sense for, say, the author Einstein, right? We, we can, in a, from a larger point of view, engage more uh, uh, sources, um, uh, 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 combine them more into a consistent image. Um, and, of course, we can get a better contextualization of our actors. Now, so I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, I came up with this, 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 you know, this, this thought about uh, how to relate to uh, Einstein uh, uh, on the occasion of a philosophy of science conference dedicated to uh, the paper on, uh, by Kuhn. Um, and the sentiment at the conference I was at was very much that, you know, we should not historicize these values that are engaged in theory choice. And, in fact, as philosophers, we should try and sort of normatively come up with with values that you know are in a way timeless, right? And um, well, you know, I think the example that I've shown and, and there are other examples actually, you know, illustrate the opposite that these virtues are very much and these values are very much historical and that you know they have a history of, of their own. Uh, and in fact, that when we would tie uh, or would would break the tie between, say, the ideal scholar or what we circulate as the ideal scholar and, and the virtues that uh, are engaged in. in choosing between theories and science, then we, we kind of lose track of the, of the people that are in our histories. Um, okay, so, um, um, yeah, so virtues guide uh, uh, and justify theory choice as do values in human judgment, so, you know. And so there's the analogy that Kuhn was playing on, but, but because of this ideal scholar that, that we uh, evoke in our uh, 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 talking about science, there's... there's a certain moral quality that, that is assigned to the scholar that makes the right choices. Um, so uh, not only should Kuhn's uh, uh, values in theory choice be historicized, but perhaps we should even think in more direct terms about them as uh, uh, ethical virtues and, and not just epistemic virtues. Thank you. So that's basically the end of the talk. He's going to add questions but I don't think they're that relevant so if we go back to here what we got from Einstein is a cuckoo process and the reason it is a cuckoo process is because he's falsifying his history Einstein's falsifying his history to try to portray himself as a mega genius so he's rewriting his history to do that so when we get down to that, it's cuckoo, whatever he's doing, it's just cuckoo. And when you look at what he's doing, it's nonsense, it just doesn't make any sense. So we go down to, and when we base, look at, try to look at what uh, Einstein is, 
the basis upon what Einstein is building or his theories upon is all just a lie. And it's all just a lie because he's rewriting his history. It's, it's, he's just crazy. It, it doesn't, he doesn't correspond to uh, how to do proper science at all. It just, just should never have been taken on by the physics establishment. They've made terrible mistake by ta taking on what Einstein's doing. It's just a complete pack of lies. And they try to justify the lies. Einstein rewrites his history, which is basically lying. And why does he lie? Well, he's trying to portray the way that you should do science, his ideal version of how to do science. So he lies. He's got, you've got, you've got trying to justify lying. There's just nothing there. It's just all lies. And that's basically it. Science has gone really profoundly wrong by adopting what Einstein has told them and with, a, with all these lies of portraying how this mega genius well it's attracted people it's been a very attractive uh, persona to have this super mega genius but it's all just based on lies so that's it, this is the end of that little talk thank you